such a blessing to be here. Um, so our scripture passage today is Luke chapter 15. And it's a long one, so I just didn't, I didn't want you to be distracted with having to read it up there, so I just thought I would read it to you and have your attention that way. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. In some ways, that's a better title for this, and you'll know what I mean as we go along. Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So the father divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in desolate living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to fill, feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will go up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father came. His father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quick, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatty calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. The slave respond, replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out, and because he pleaded and, be and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you and have never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who was devouring your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because your bro this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So our topic for this month is forgiveness. And we've had some wonderful music on that theme. Last week we talked about God's forgiveness of us. We talked about um, especially the pattern of how I'm sorry can come before, excuse me, I, I, I forgive you can go before I'm sorry. So we talked about that last week. 
Uh, this week, we're going to hit the overall topic of forgiveness in our lives. So I want to read to you, I'm, I've been reading about six different books on forgiveness, um, just because it's really been probably the hardest topic for me to preach on ever. As I said last week, um, I've never really preached on forgiveness in all my years of being a pastor because I knew it was a really big topic and I knew it would be a really hard one and one that would not be easy to, to even address in one week. Um, and so I'm really thankful for this period, this month, to talk about it, uh, and I've put some effort into trying to get my head around it. I want to read to you something I've read in one of these books. Um, it reads more like a prayer than anything. Forgiveness is for you and not the offender. Forgiveness is taking back your power. Forgiveness is taking responsibility for how you feel. Forgiveness is about your healing and not about the people who hurt you. Forgiveness is trainable. Forgiveness helps you get control over your feelings. Forgiveness can improve your mental and physical health. Forgiveness is becoming a hero instead of a victim. Forgiveness is a choice. Everyone can learn to forgive. Now here's what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not condoning unkindness. Forgiveness is not forgetting that something painful happened. Forgiveness is not excusing poor behavior. Forgiveness is not denying or minimizing your hurt. Forgiveness does not mean reconciling with your offender. Forgiveness does not mean you give up having feelings. We'll turn that into a prayer as the weeks go on. So I have a story of pain and hurt um, that I'm going to share with you. Um, a couple of months ago, went to Alabama. My mom has uh, recently had this really amazing surgery that uh, has great promise for her to be back to fullness of life, uh, but really, really difficult surgery. I remember sharing a lot about that with you. So I went to see her before the surgery because I couldn't be there at the exact time of the surgery. Went beforehand and... Um, you know, they're very different than I am. And we got in an argument. We got in an argument about how we're different. Um, uh, it was political. And as much energy as there is in the world right now about politics, it was all right there in that room with my mom. And at that moment, uh, she said, well, we've made mistakes. And something inside of me was absolutely knocked down, knocked flat on my back. Because I really know what she, well, what I heard in that was that I am a mistake. And it has really pained me. I've shared it with a couple of you. A couple of you, I've told this story. And I appreciate you hearing me. But I knew that I was going to be preaching on forgiveness of all things. <sighs> and so I was going to have to look at this issue and this pain that I've had with my mom. 
So we have a story, and I just want to walk back through this story a little bit because it is one of the most beautiful stories in the Bible. It's only found in Luke, um, and it's often called the prodigal son. That's probably what you've heard it as, the prodigal son. There's a whole lot more going on in this story than just a son that's gone astray. So I really prefer the title of the story to be the father who has two sons. The father with two sons. The father of two sons. So we all know the first part really, really well. If you know the prodigal son, then you know the first part probably better than the second act. But the story is, of course, that uh, the youngest son, that's important, the youngest son goes to his father and says, I want my part. I want my part in the inheritance that I am I'm guaranteed. Now, in this culture, what that means is he would have gotten, with two sons, he would have gotten one-third. Uh, in that culture, the older brother would have gotten two-thirds and the younger brother, one-third. So he goes to his father, asks for his share. Now, it's been interpreted that that means, you know, I kind of wish you'd go ahead and die so I can get my part. Right? Now, there's a, there's a parenting lesson in this, and I'm going to try not to talk about parenting. But what I, I want you to hear is that... Um, this father acts in a, in, a, in a different way than you might have. Um, you know, we all live with different lives and treat our children for whatever reason, but this father chooses to go ahead and meet the request. That is not a judgment if you choose to not give your child everything they ask, okay? That's not what this story is about. But he seems to give him just enough rope to see what's going to happen, right? And the beautiful thing is we're not told right then that this really even hurt the father's feelings. I kind of suspect that this younger son has been a problem for a while. <laughs> and he's not really that surprised. And so, you know, we... We don't need to know how the father's doing. We don't need to know if this, you know, if his feelings have been hurt by, you know, asked if he could just go ahead and die. So he gives him his one-third. He gives him that rope he needs to see if he'll hang himself, right? To, you know, just to see if he can do what he can to reach him. Gives him his portion. And, of course, the younger son goes off into another country, says he goes off to another land, and he just squanders it all. Then a famine comes, a hard time happens, and he ends up hungry and feeding the pigs. Now, for a Jewish person to be around pigs is to be unclean. So there's, that's meant to show that he's really, you know, he's really having it as bad as it can be. He's hungry, and he's feeding the pigs. And what he says there, he doesn't even get to say all of it later, but what he decides is about uh, reconcil uh, reconciliation. He decides the words to say, I'm sorry. And I'm not wanting this to be about reconciliation, but I do want to read this because it's different later. Um, he says, he practices what he's going to say to his father. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So then he heads back home. And before, before he's even home, his father sees him afar. Now, you know, you have to kind of wonder if that father wasn't calculating. Well, it's famine. And if he's living like he's always been living, he's probably on his last limb. And I'm expecting him any time now. So maybe you get the feeling that he's at the window or at the porch just anticipating his younger son will come. So he runs out to meet him. 
He doesn't even need to hear a word. And so all this speech that the son has planned, this younger son has planned, doesn't even get out his mouth. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. That's all he gets to say. He doesn't even get to say, please treat me like one of your servants. Please, I don't even want to be called your son anymore, but I just want a meal. Uh, he doesn't even get to say that before the father says, quickly, 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 bring the robe. And then it's not just a robe. It's not just let's clean him up, but let's give him the best robe, the best one. That would be, of course, the father's robe. Go get my robe. Go get my things. Go get my ring and put it on him. Put all of my things on him. And welcome him back with a feast, the biggest feast, the fatted calf, and celebrate that the son that was lost has been found. Now that is such a beautiful story, right? And that's really where most of our memory of this story ends. Because we mostly remember it's about the prodigal son and a father that amazingly welcomes him back. But what I want to talk about today, and I know I got really caught up in that part, but what I really want to talk about is the second, really the first son, the oldest son, but the second act. So the elder son is out in the field and he's heading back in for the evening and he hears a ruckus is going on he hears a lot of noise going on there's a party and he of all people should know what if there's a party planned and the servant says no that your your brother is back and they've met they've killed the fatted calf so he doesn't even go in He starts a storyline in his head, right? Maybe you've experienced something like this. A grievance has happened, and you start a story that becomes really sacred to you, that becomes what you tell yourself and really plant in your heart what happens. So he starts a story that's like, Well, that no good for nothing brother that took everything already, he's back and now getting more than his share. He's getting the best when I didn't even get anything. I didn't even get the goat, much less the fatted calf for me and my friends. Now, this is where the father does the best move of all. Because, you know, he kind of knew that the, the wayward son was messing up. But the son that had always been there, This is where I think the real magic of the story happens. He stands beside him and teaches him how to forgive. This is often seen as a story of forgiveness of the prodigal son. But the real magic is how he stands beside the older brother and shows him how to do it. First of all, he wants to nip in the bud that grievance story. That he gives him a chance to say it all. He puts it all, he lets, he listens to the son say all of the pain that is going on there about how jealous he is. He doesn't even call his brother his brother. He says to his father, your son, your other son. He's not my brother. He's your son and you're doing all this. While I have obeyed you, you're just giving everything away to him. So as that father is standing next to the older son, who's upset and jealous and really angry, he just lets him get it all out. And then he won't let him hold to that story. He offers another story that will relieve him of his pain. That jealousy that he has inside of him is going to relieve him of that. He says, son, son, you are always with me. Now, what's interesting about that is that he's he's acknowledging the relationship that they have 
And yes, everything is still going to go to you, my son. But even after I'm gone, even after I'm passed away, I will still be with you. He doesn't say, I've always been with you. I will always be with you. I will, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. So he establishes that connection again. And then he tries to connect him to the brother by saying, but we had to celebrate and rejoice because your brother was dead and now he's come alive. Now that's not the way the brother, the older brother sees it. He doesn't see that he's back to life. So this father is giving him a different script, a different story so that he can let go of his grievance. One that was lost is found. He's offering a different story. Now that's the beautiful part about forgiveness. Is that it can be taught. It can be taught. Now if you remember the pattern that we had last week, we say that the Bible's most often pattern of forgiveness is I forgive and then there's, I'm sorry. In our culture, we usually think, well, they didn't say I'm sorry, so I'm not going to say, I uh, forgive them. But in the Bible, most of the time, it's, I forgive you. And then follows, I am sorry. So this father is trying to create forgiveness in the brother, in the older brother's heart, in mind so that the younger brother can have a lifelong relationship with him even after the father leaves and passes away. And he guides him on how to do that. So in these books I've read, <laughs> Forgive for Good and all these other books, and you'll, you'll see them listed in your, in your bulletin, there's a couple of things that we can all learn. First of all, not everyone has a grudge that they're holding. But many of us have a grudge that is so old, it's, it's, you know, it's amazing how long people can hold grudges and how that can change the course of your life even. So I don't tread lightly on saying these suggestions of how to heal forgiveness. But just like the father stood beside the older brother and held their hand, held his hand and tried to walk him through what to do, there are things that you can do to find forgiveness for a grudge you might have. So these are suggestions. You can share your pain with someone that you trust. So share your story with someone. Just and clearly identify that story, get it out there. You can find peace. Every moment, every bit of energy that you're putting into that story, that pain, it actually can be replaced with peace and love and goodwill. It can, it can. You really have to believe it, that it is possible, but it can. You have to recognize that the story that you create is a grievance story. And there can be an alternative story, a forgiveness story. And that's what we have in this story from the, from the Bible. We have both in this story. We have the older son who's trotting down grievous. He's ready to have a really difficult time. But we have a father that has nothing but forgiveness. So we have both of them. And if that's true in this story, we can also have it as well. If we have a difficult pain that we haven't forgiven, actually, there could be a different story to that as well. Now, a key part of forgiveness is recognizing that the pain that is, you have is because of some kind of rule that you have in your life. I have in my life a belief that a mother should love 
her child no matter what. Now that's why it really bothers me that my mother could tell me that she made a mistake with me. That's why it really bothers me. But I'm sticking to a really strict rule there with that, right? Mothers don't always love their children, in truth. Also, to, for, to find forgiveness, you look for love in you. You look for love in the world. And you seek out those times, those loves, and you just add them in, and you find that the space in your heart that had that grievance story, that pain, can be moved out. In other words, that place in your heart, that, that space in your heart can be replaced with an ever-expanding love and goodness. Now, here's the beautiful part about forgiveness. Is a story of grievance is a story of victimization. Look at what someone did to me. Look at what my mother did to me. A story of forgiveness is a story of a hero. We love this father in this story. He is amazing. The older brother is on the track for a victim. Look at what my brother did to me. But he could become a hero as well. I'm going to accept my brother in as well and love him to new life as well. So here's what I've learned from my, my mom in my conversation with her where she said, you know, we've made mistakes. And I, of course, I wrote that story as I am a mistake. I mean, I, I will admit that. I wrote that grievance story as I am a mistake. Here's what I've learned, though. Regularly, I tell my children, I will make mistakes with you. I will make mistakes with you. That's in essence what my, father, my mother said. We made mistakes. If I go ahead and say that, not when the energy's all high and difficult and full of anger, but if I say it in love now, how much easier is it going to be to say it when we do have difficult moments? So I go ahead and I'm thankful for my mom. I go ahead and try to incorporate that into my life as a mother myself. Now, this is not about reconciliation. I do hope that my mom and I can talk about this uh, in the future. But having walked weeks after weeks of waking up every moment, every morning, thinking, I'm a mistake to my mom, I can stand here and tell you right now, I don't feel that way anymore. And I'm grateful for this sermon series of forgiveness. Whatever it is that your grievance story is, you can find forgiveness. You can. And I know that mine is small in comparison with some of the amazingly difficult things that people have to go through. You can free yourself from that pain and replace it with peace and replace it with love and replace it with goodwill. We just have to follow the model of the Father in our story who say that which was lost can be found. <laughs>